I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everyone. How are you? I'm doing well. We had okay. a little technical glitch, but we got over it very quickly. So I'm quite uh, well. And that's great. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Adams, do you want to uh, start us off or do you want me to jump right into my presentation? Yeah, um, so wel welcome everybody. Just wanted to uh, you know, you know, thank the FNGLA uh, members and, and FNGLA for supporting this work. Um, also wanted to thank the investigators uh, for, for attending this presentation. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. Jerry will touch on that, but yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. I did want to mention one thing, which is that we're going to be recording this. Um, and so uh, just, just for everybody's uh, awareness that uh, th this is going to be recorded. Um, Jerry, I'll go ahead and just hand it over to you at this point. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Adams. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see uh, everyone. I assume Linda's somewhere on this screen. Yep, there's Linda. Good morning. And Ed and others involved with FNGLA. Um, a lot of thanks goes to our team here who put together both the report that you all will have very quickly and also this presentation. Thanks to the researchers that are on this Zoom. They did the heavy lifting, the hard work, them and their students. And it's so important that we have this source of funding from you all at FNGLA as our faculty can take that money and leverage it to do either pilot studies or with their existing research efforts and uh, end up with higher quality data, more data, or the opportunity to secure state or federal funding. So again, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my... Uh... Can you all see this? Can you all see my presentation? No. No, okay. Um... I'm not sure why that PowerPoint's not pulling up. Yeah, it's an active. Can you all see that? Not yet. All right. Jerry, it, it says you're a guest and the participants, so maybe you need somebody needs to make you a host. Okay, and we may we may have had to take myself off of being a host to, in order to get me in the room for this particular meeting. Looks like Kristen is currently the host. Yeah, so I need to be a co-host. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry for that. So I'll keep the uh, presentation moving along for the benefit of your valuable time. Um, FNGLA has well-established priorities uh, for research and extension efforts that uh, our faculty who want to secure funding are very aware of. They include for this year's or this past year's round of funding, five priority areas. That is to improve environmental and resource, resource management, to improve pest management practices and strategies, also to improve production system practices and strategies, genetics and breeding to enhance quantities and diversity of plant material, and the overarching goal of enhancing Floridians' quality of life. And hopefully I'm very soon going to be a co-host. I think we're getting there. Looks like you're a host now, Jerry. Okay. I see progress. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Does everyone see on my first slide here? We do, but you just got to, uh, we see your present presenter mode side of things. Oh, okay. If you go to the top to display settings, you should be able to just tell it to swap screens. Yep. Thank you very much. All right. So here we are. As I just noted, there are five principal uh, research priority areas that the committee has um, put together, both in the past and updated to the present. And for the 2022-2023 the round of funded projects, um, the committee did approve nine of those requests, and this is close to $63,000 of total funding. 
Uh, this does span across our four academic departments here on the main campus here in Gainesville. It includes the agronomy department, entomology and nematology, environmental horticulture, and plant pathology. Um, because of our expansive system, we're able to engage readily with our nursery growers, landscapers, and others uh, through our network of research and education centers. And for this particular round of funding, that includes six of our RECs, as we call them, Fort Lauderdale, Mid-Florida, Indian River, Tropical down in the Miami-Dade area, Gulf Coast in that Hillsborough County area, and North Florida REC. I think the particular location there is the Quincy location west of Tallahassee. Uh, Dr. Adams and I and, and um, Research Dean Dr. Rob Gilbert want to thank the review committee members who put in time to review all these proposals. Uh, these members include Ed Bra Bravo, and I apologize if I don't get these names exactly correct, uh, Joe uh, Salone, uh, Van Donnan, Sylvia Gordon, Stefan Lapiros, uh, Dr. David Liu, Mike Marshall, uh, David McDonald, Nancy McDonald, and Linda Rindell. So thank you very much for your efforts and for um, reviewing these uh, proposals. So let's move to objective uh, number one, um, to improve environmental and resource management. And under this particular research priority, there were three funded projects in this current round, and I will discuss the first one. And this first one includes efforts from Dr. Paul Fisher and his research program. Uh, Dr. Fisher is in the Department of Environmental Horticulture and is based here on the Gainesville campus. Um, their overview for this particular research effort was to determine correct irrigation scheduling for valuable young plants, uh, in particular, the misting efforts uh, that leads to healthier plants with more aggressive rooting in a nursery setting. Um, in a controlled environment. So their objective was to evaluate climate sensors, a number of them, and the timing of these misting events. Um, this project did lead to providing pilot data, and that is so important to not only Dr. Fisher's program, but other programs here, um, faculty at the RECs and, and main campus in terms of securing more data. And that's what Dr. Fisher has indicated that this data should lead to a solid proposal for additional USDA ARS research funding. Um, there are more details about the benefits of some of these sensors um, and the case studies that were done at commercial operations. And I encourage you to reach out to Dr. Fisher directly um, if you'd like to hear more about those results. The next funded project is developing water efficient pollinator plants for Florida. This was led by uh, principal investigator, Dr. Rachel Mallinger, who's in the Department of Entomology and Nematology based here in the Gainesville campus. And then Dr. Xavier Martini, um, who is also an entomologist, nematologist um, based out of the North Florida Research and Education Center in Quincy. And the overview of this project was to com compare native and non-native plants that are similar in terms of their genus to their value to pollinators and their performance in water limited environments. Uh, the goal was to, to identify plants that serve as po valuable pollinator resource and do well with limited irrigation. Um, their findings include um, the fact that there was an exception to the pollinators in terms of the mystic spires uh, species um, in terms of attracting pollinators but the Indian blanket type species did especially well as a pollinator source. Um, again, both this work was done at the North Florida Research and Education Center Quincy location and our Plant Science Research and Education Unit at Citra, providing two different environments for these different plant species. Why is this important? Because in surveys done uh, by the Mallinger Lab, it's been determined that up to 50% of surveyed gardeners look for pollinator friendly plants for their garden settings. So it is indeed important to those um, stakeholders that are planning either hobby or, or even approaching commercial gardens as they look for effective pollinators uh, for their plants. The next funded project deals with palm species. In particular, palm nutrition injection. Does this particular effort work? And if it does, for how long? This was led by uh, Dr. Kimberly Moore, who's an environmental horticulturalist that's based at Fort Lauderdale Research and Education Center, which is 
um, down in that Davie area uh, in Southeast Florida. The co-PI for this project is also at that same REC location, Dr. Micah McMillan, also an environmental horticulturalist. Um, what is known about palms is that palms are not um, visually or rapidly as responsive to fertilizer than other landscape plants. That can often lead to homeowners and others being disappointed by the lack of, of a response early on. In fact, it may take up to two years to see an effective response from a nutrient management um, application or injection. Um, this study does require time to yield results uh, because of this long response period. And so data is still being accumulated at this point. And I think the best take home message from their efforts is stay tuned. Um, I think in 2024, we may even have a follow up with some more definitive results because the issue here is homeowners have expectations uh, from those in the FNGLA industry that provide these nutrient injection services you know, and we need to better define when they work and how long will it take for that response to yield um, a favorable plant um, type effect, which the homeowner or others are looking for. So again, stay tuned for that and uh, thank them for their efforts. Moving on to the next priority on the research side, um, this particular objective is to improve pest management practices and strategies. There were four funded projects in this particular pri priority area here for this current round of funding. First one I'll talk about is under the direction of Adam Dale, who is an entomologist, nematologist in that particular academic department here based in the Gainesville campus with co-PIs Jacqueline uh, Buenarasto also in that same department, Brian uh, Bader, entomologist who's based out of the Fort Lauderdale Research and Education Center, and Carrie Harmon, um, who's a plant pathologist, also heads up our plant diagnostic lab here on the Gainesville campus. Uh, lethal bronzing is, is a real challenge for us across the state. It's rapidly killing palms uh, up and down Florida, and the current management approach um, in the landscape where palms are is essentially preventative antibiotic injections and insecticide applications, which can become costly and, and not sustainable at this point. So they were looking to do research efforts to develop a set of guidelines on uh, site selection, uh, density of planning, disease monitoring efforts, and, and more defined pest management tactics for urban and residential um, landscapes. Their results, showed that palms sh should, if you're gonna look at this particular disease, lethal bronzing, the palm should be sampled at the beginning or end of the calendar year as the infection intensity during the summer is not very high. And palms in the USDA hardiness zone nine seem to be the most affected. That would be central Florida uh, with um, the lethal phytoplasma um, uh, disease. Uh, Phoenix palms are at the highest risk of infection when planted at low densities in cool sites and with less than 46% um, surrounding um, impervious surface. And I see there, my presentation must be on a, on a timed approach. So if you have more questions about that on the Palm side, I would encourage you to reach out to uh, Dr. Kimberly Moore specifically um, for their progress on that particular effort. The next research study is the monitoring testing of management strategies for thrips paraspinus in Palm Beach County. And this is a, a problematic issue that was identified in, in the summer of 2020 under the leadership of Dr. Lance Armstrong. He's an entomologist based out of the Mid-Florida Research and Education Center near Ap Apopka. Um, along with him, co-PI is Mohammed Ahmed and Cindy McKenzie, um, both with uh, Mohammed's with USDA ARS and John Roberts with Palm Beach County Extension. Um, this species has been observed in other uh, counties throughout the state. It feeds on many different types of ornamentals and also in our vegetable industry, which makes it rather uh, problematic. Uh, surveys were done to, to better um, ascertain where this 
pest is spreading to where it's at currently as it started out in Orange County, uh, Florida. Um, training tools um, needed to be developed also for identification and thrips management for this particular problematic species were developed and, and extended. Part of this effort was also to look um, at the retail and to see if th these thrips were uh, being sold on plants and being moved out to the residential um, side of the business. And in this survey effort, 13 of 14 stores that were surveyed uh, had uh, thrips infested plants of this particular species at outdoor nurseries. And, and that is extremely problematic because that only increases the spread potential. Um, Their efforts did demonstrate that four releases of predatory thrips in uh, Gardenia and Palm Beach resulted in substantial control. So this is something Dr. Lance Armstrong has done a lot of work on over the years using banker plants, using predatory species. In this case, um, this particular thrip that will affect um, the thrips part, uh, part of this spinous. And uh, he did see control. And so there may be an issue there where we can move away from conventional um, insecticides to a certain extent, like by bifenthrin, and, and use more natural enemies uh, to keep these uh, thrips threshold below economically damaging levels in a, in a controlled environment um, type setting. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, we have some good people that would love to come in this particular meeting. And so I'm probably going to have to. All right. Okay. I apologize for that. I guess I actually have too much control in this presentation. So if you have any questions about the uh, effectiveness of baker, banker plant usage and these uh, uh, type of uh, thrips to control um, the invasive species, uh, do reach out to Dr. Lance Arms Osborne directly. Moving on to our next uh, funded study, um, this was undertaken by a faculty member, Nicole Quinn, who's an entomologist at the Indian River Research and Education Center located near Fort Pierce. And also with co-PIs, Dr. Ahmad, USDA ARS, and Dr. Osborne, who's also, who is located at Mid-Florida, REC. Lubbock mealy, mealy bug has invaded 60 countries in the tropics and subtropics and feeds on many cultivated and wild plants. And so this is very problematic. And uh, it, this particular species poses a, a significant threat to Florida ornamental landscape and, and the nursery industry. The identification of Lubbock mealybug is essential to, to effective management, but mealybugs are difficult to identify and detect. So the challenge here and what the researchers undertook is to pursue safe, accurate, and species-specific field diagnostic kit, kits. Um, get those developed and distributed at workshops. These kits are not copyrighted, they're freely available. Um, these kits and the overall effort did lead to peer-reviewed publications and significant media um, attention. And that's important to get this information disseminated out to those in the FNGLA, FNGLA industry. Um, PI and, and co-PIs did conduct presentations and hands-on training uh, for nursery growers to demonstrate how they worked. And this was done back in April. There are recordings of this workshop and hopefully that can be linked to your FNGLA website. And if not, I encourage you to reach out to Dr. Quinn directly or our office of research here on the campus at the University of Florida. And we will make sure we get that link to you. Future research that Dr. Quinn and others will be pursuing includes improving Lubbock mealybug integrated pest management, which those efforts should lead to better detection, integration of chemical crop protection uh, control and biological control. 
The next funded study is titled The Evaluation of the Parasitoid uh, Catalactacus hunteri as a biocontrol agent for hibiscus um, bud weevil. The lead PI for this particular research effort is Dr. Alexandra Raventhi, who's an entomologist, nematologist based in, at the Tropical Research and Education Center down near Homestead. Uh, this particular species is a weevil uh, parasitoid um, that may um, control hibiscus bud weevil. So that is the grand challenge and, that, and that's what they were trying to look at here. Um, because this particular pest is regulated by FDAX, Division of Plant Industry, um, that affects tropical hibiscus. The summary of their particular research effort um, includes laboratory and greenhouse experiments suggests that um, this particular uh, parasitoid uh, shows potential in controlling the hibiscus um, weevil larvae. When the parasitoids were in co contact with the exposed hibiscus bud weevil, development stages, significantly, significant mortality was caused to the second instar. When this particular parasitoid were in contact with the uh, hibiscus bud weevil concealed development stages, mortality was significantly greater for the first in, instar. So releasing one female per 15 flower buds did not differ from releasing a higher number of individuals, but caused more mortality than the control under laboratory conditions. The single relief release of a parasitoid pair showed potential to control this particular problematic weevil under greenhouse conditions. Future research includes uh, the, uh, the rate and population growth when this particular uh, parasitoid feeds on hibiscus bud weevil larvae and the best way to release this particular parasitoid in the hibiscus nursery. More research is required here to explore the full potential uh, of this as a biocontrol agent for the hibiscus blood weevil and to optimize its release in nursery settings. The last objective uh, for which funded studies were, were under for this round of funding includes genetics and breeding to enhance quantities and diversity of plant material. The first one I'm gonna discuss, uh, research effort, is developing sterile non-invasive porter weed for the Florida nursery and landscape industry and consumers. This particular research effort was undertaken by Dr. Zanao Dang. Uh, he's an environmental horticulturalist that's based at the Gulf Coast Research and Education Center located near Balm in Hillsborough County. Co-PIs for this particular effort include Brooks Parish, who is an um, environmental uh, horticulture uh, faculty member, uh, also based at the Gulf Coast Research and Education Center, and Dr. Sa Sandra Wilson, who's based in the Gainesville campus, also in that same academic department. Overview of this study includes the reality that nettle, nettle leaf porterweed is a category two invasive species here in Florida, and it's widely uh, distributed. If we could find a sterile alternative, um, this may reduce the spread of this invasive species and also provide the FNGLA industry with greater diversity of plant materials and new opportunities to market uh, these particular species of garden plants to consumers uh, for attracting butterflies and other pollinators. So under the leadership of Dr. Deng, 20 triploid lines were developed um, in his particular lab and research program. Three sterile triploid, and I'm referring to the DNA um, end of this particular effort, um, were trialed at three locations. Uh, the three triploids were confirmed to be, to be male and female sterile and showed excellent landscape performance at, at, at all three locations. Future research is needed to document the differences and, and prepare all that needs to be done to move this potential cultivar through approval and get it to the industry where it can be to the benefit of nursery growers and others who desire to market this type of species. The last funded study I'm gonna discuss here this morning is detecting genetic variation of sugarcane mosaic, mosaic virus in St. Augustine grass cultivars here in the state of Florida. Uh, the PI for this project is Dr. Xingping Wang, 
Uh, he's a faculty member in our Department of Agronomy based here in the Gainesville campus with co-PI Dr. Camilla Sanchez, also in that same academic department. So the overview of this particular um, viral problematic disease is that uh, lethal viral necrosis disease affects Floratam St. Augustine grass and is caused by the sugarcane mosaic virus and causes se severe economic loss to the turf grass industry here in Florida and beyond. So far it is unknown whether there are different pathogenic strains for sugarcane mosaic virus infecting St. Augustine grass. This information that they gleaned from, from this initial effort will help us better understand the variations of the sugarcane mosaic virus in the field. And we can also begin to strategically design molecular tools to target the virus for more better and effective control. So the summary from Dr. Wang's lab includes um, the viral protein sequences um, were varied among the samples with 74% to 93% sequence identity to reference to the reference genome of this particular sugarcane mosaic virus uh, disease. The isolations from the same county had similar sequences, se sequences suggesting that the same strain may be spreading out in the same county, and that is indeed problematic. This information will further benefit the Florida turf grass industry by enhancing our understanding of the, the LVN disease development in Floratam, St. Augustine grass. And you can see the potential benefit of this because so much of this sod that becomes infected has to be replaced in, in HOA type subdivisions and across uh, commercial landscapes um, up and down the state with uh, Floratam type species of St. Augustine grass. Um, there are further questions that they wanna look at Moving forward, these include, um, are there symptom variations among St. Augustine grass infected by different strains of this virus? Can we develop the molecular tools according to particular uh, consensus sequence that they've been working with in the lab? And for me personally, I have a brand new uh, St. Augustine lawn here in my yard in Gainesville. It's Citra Blue St. Augustine grass. And uh, certainly I have a stake in this because I wanna see that beautiful uh, bluish, St. Augustine type appearance in my front yard for years to come. So um, I, along with many other homeowners and commercial landscapers appreciate the efforts of Dr. Wang and others in the Department of Agronomy. With that, I moved through these very quickly, but it, I did wanna just summarize all nine funded projects and give those in attendance on the FNGLA, FNGLA side an opportunity to ask some of the research researchers direct questions related to their uh, research efforts over the past year. So with that, I will exit. And can everyone see everyone else again? Yes. You haven't exited yet. We still see your presentation. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, seem to be, there we go. All right. So thank you very much. Again, I moved rather quickly through that. Um, we do have some of our, um, the majority of our uh, principal investigators, possibly some graduate students or postdocs even stepping in to uh, answer any questions you may have about the studies. So, and I will apologize for misspelling of names and maybe an error or two in describing your studies, but it was fascinating reading through them. And uh, I know Dr. Paul Fisher and his work, and I just get excited when I see that. My master's work nearly 30 years ago was dealt with cuttings and grafting um, on the uh, crop physiology side. So. Um, with that, I open it up to the room. And does anyone have any questions for our talented faculty members here in UF IFAS? Before some of the questions, I just want to jump on and say thank you to Dr. Finkhauser and Dr. Adams and to all the researchers for coming together to do this uh, webinar. I, I think 
not only the the written summaries that you all have been doing, this just gives gives FNGLA members an added level of connection to the research that's being done um, with the industry. And I appreciate you doing this each year. It's been something we added since COVID. And I, I think I, I would love to see this continue and grow and get more members involved in seeing these projects because the only way we're going to answer some of these challenges is to be able to um, connect the dots and, and thank you for that. So um, I, I would also throw out as we are um, looking at this year's projects or, you know, this next year's uh, slate of, of projects, do any of the researchers that may have submitted a project this year have some specific things that um, they're concerned that the research or that the review committee looks at um, in regards to their their project. Maybe I can throw that out and have the opportunity to do that as well. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Linda, can you hear me? All right. Uh, so I have a comment and, and a question. Uh, um, as uh, one of the folks on the committee that makes these decisions, I think it would be helpful to have, and th this is a fantastic forum, and thank you all for the work you're doing for our industry. Um, uh, but I think it would be helpful to schedule this meeting with a little bit more time in between when the, uh, the, the, the projects for next year are, are due. We actually submitted, I guess today was the day that they were due for next year. And it would be helpful to hear all these comments prior to commenting on potentially the same projects two years in a row without hearing all these comments, we've already made our decision. So it would have been helpful to have a few extra days in between these two events uh, or uh, deadlines to uh, help guide us. Uh, so that's, that's my one comment for the group. Uh, my question is about the pollinator uh, plant uh, research, uh, natives versus cultivars. And I am very interested in how that will affect uh, how folks look at um, the value of cultivars. There's a trend to uh, um, what's the best way of saying is give a bad rap to cultivars in, uh, in favor of natives. We're all in favor of using as many natives as possible, but there seems to be a political slant towards uh, um, giving a, a, a bad reputation to cultivars in general, uh, trees, plants, ground covers, all of, all of our products are being attacked by county codes and uh, different departments around the state that are using your science in ways that I don't think you intend for them to be used. So uh, I'm very curious uh, about uh, the how that pollinator research uh, came out. Does uh, Is there science that shows that uh, natives are superior in value pollen-wise than native or than exotics, which is the term they're using for cultivars? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. I guess a few things that I would say. Um, one, we found that there were some exceptions to the overall trend. So the salvia uh, mystic spires, for example, a non-native cultivated plant was equally attractive to similar natives. Uh, and so I think that that um, suggests that there can be exceptions and maybe suggests that we should look for those exceptions. Um, and we there probably are other exceptions as well. We tested 20 plants total. So certainly not all of the plants that can uh, possibly be put in a yard. Um, so I would say that it's not a conclusion we should make for all plants. There, there are exceptions. We should look for those exceptions. Um, the second thing I would note is that this wasn't presented on the slide, but not all pollinators respond better to native plants than non-native. Um, the main exceptions there are honeybees. They're not a native bee. So it's not surprising that they don't uh, prefer native plants. So if your main goal is to provide resources for honeybees specifically, uh, the non-natives were equally attractive to the natives. Uh, and then finally, in terms of nectar quantity, uh, there's not necessarily a difference. 
And so what's driving those preferences for native plants for some of the pollinators is probably uh, they've evolved with the native plants. They, they have that association with the native plants. When you think about butterflies, for example, and you think about host plants for butterflies, um, you can't really force them to use exotic plants. They've evolved with some of the natives. Uh, and so there are some native pollinators that will need native plants, but we have others like honeybees that will utilize non-natives. Um, we have some exceptions, non-natives that are very attractive. And then in terms of overall nectar quantity, um, there, there wasn't actually a, an overall difference between the natives and the non-natives, if that answers your question. Uh, so yeah, our, our conclusion was not that all, you know, all uh, natives are better for all pollinators. Ted, did that answer your question? That, sure, go ahead. That, that does answer my question. It just, uh, I think it needs to be, uh, um, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the general public or industry needs to uh, do a better job of uh, explaining those uh, differences right. and those yeah. different values for different yeah. segments of our growers. Exactly, oh. yeah, yeah. Right, you know, if you're planting a butterfly garden, for example, you need to have those native host plants for the caterpillars. You can't really get around that, but you can have other stuff too. And it's it's similar for bee pollinators. Um, there are bees that they, they do need those native plants. That's what they've evolved with but the non-natives uh, fill a, a niche, have a role as well. And then to, to your first point, I would um, I would agree. And I will visit with Dr. Adams. Uh, Damien, you may want to come on, comment on that, but that, that sounds like a logical pursuit to try to try to go ahead and have this ahead of the final review. Uh, we do have one or two studies here that, that need follow-up data to really better define um, the objectives and 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 glean some results like palm nutrition that you know that's going to essentially be a two year study. So, uh, Damien, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I wanted to comment that on that and also just follow up on on something that uh, Dr. Malinger said. Um, yeah, I think I think we can we can accommodate the schedule to to make that work at least at least give three or four days, uh, you know, distance between this presentation and you know at least when when we are asking for the reviews on the new proposals to be completed. Um, and we'll we'll make a note to do that. Um, so, you know, just thinking about, uh, you know, getting the word out, I, I would encourage everybody here, you know, all of the, the uh, you know, the funded PIs to think about working with IFAS Communication Services. You know, it, it sounds like, uh, you know, Rachel, it sounds like you've got a, a, some very interesting results and conclusions that, you know, I, I think the general public would be very interested in, in learning about. And so uh, through ICS, um, you know, they can assist in terms of developing, you know, blog posts and, you know, getting, um, you know, articles written that might be picked up by print media, that sort of thing. So just want to encourage everybody to, you know, think about reaching out to ICS and 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 pr just provide a little blurb on sort of the, you know, the key uh, key insights and sort of where you think the, the research is going. You know, I, I think that would really help get the word out. I think if I could tag something. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, well, I, I think too, just to add to that, I think we could help um, with our uh, Florida gardening um, website that we try to do some articles and things marketed to the consumers through FNGLA. So the the coordination with some of our efforts and and your you know research data would be really good. So let's keep that conversation going. If, if I could just tack something on to Ed's comments also, uh, I know Ed's going to roll his eyes when I bring it up, but it's just a fact that we're, we're dealing with more and more. Uh, there are some some sources of publications out there, uh, and there's a growing number of, uh, you know, from a landscape designer standpoint, there's a growing number of customers that, that I uh, talk to every day who are more and more educated uh, not and more and more interested not just in uh, pollinators, but in the, you know, the uh, uh, environmental services, specifically uh, the, uh, what do they call it, the, uh, the, the insect volume, the insect uh, uh, volume of, of plants and, and the support that the, the plants that they're uh, planting in their landscapes uh, give to the insect populations. Uh, that's something I would say to kind of keep, a, keep an eye on, you know, there's a growing number of customers who are not just interested in a in a good looking plant, but now they're starting to get educated on the, you know, the insect biomass and the, the uh, environmental services given to by, uh, by some of these color items. Uh, just that, that's, it's, it's, 
something we're not used to, but, but it's something we're, we're having to kind of educate ourselves on and, and get used to designing uh, with those principles in mind now. Yeah, does any faculty member want to comment on that? That's a great point, Stefan. I would just say if that could be maybe more so reflected in the priorities that are that are presented um, when the call for proposals comes out. I'm not looking at it right now, but from what I remember from those priorities, I don't think there's much about biodiversity enhancement or like wildlife conservation type topics on there. Yeah, and that's again, that's not that's not something we're used to dealing with, but that is, you know, a, a customer driven, uh, you know, end user driven uh, subject matter coming up. So if that's something that the, the committee feels is is a priority, then maybe add that to that priority list. And I think it could fit in multiple of the like overarching categories. Very good. Other comments? Other questions? If not, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Adams. Damien, do you want to uh, close us out? Yeah, thanks everybody. And you know, thank you once again to the FNGLA. Um, you know, this this fund is very important to our faculty. Uh, you know, to uh, you know investigate you know, in, important issues that matter to the membership of FNGLA and uh, provide our faculty with an opportunity to develop um, you know, proof of concept and uh, preliminary data needed to, to advance their research programs in ways that, that, are, that are important to the state. Um, so we've been doing this for quite a number of years. Um, you know, it, it is, uh, you know, it's become a fixture of our um, internal uh, funding landscape. And we really appreciate the, the important relationship that we have you know, with FNGLA and with the FNGLA membership uh, in supporting our faculty programs. Um, you know, with that, I just, you know, just, just want to, uh, you know, again, thank all of the investigators. Appreciate you all being available uh, here for Q&A and the hard work that you do and, um, you know, the, the importance of your programs um, for the economy of FNGLA members. Um, so, so thanks everybody. And, and for the FNGLA folks on the call, I'm looking forward to, to engaging with you on Monday as we're reviewing these proposals and, you know, uh, selecting the the next you know group of of exciting you know, uh, you know research projects that uh, that we'll we'll be hearing about next year. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.